Ontario, Canada, is a place known for its peaceful tranquility, where neighbors wave hello and families gather at local events. But beneath the surface of this idyllic community, a dark chapter in Canadian criminal history unfolds, one that sends shockwaves through the nation. In April 2006, a massacre takes place that exposes a world of violence, betrayal, and shattered loyalties. It is a day that will forever etch the name Wayne Kellestein into the annals of infamy. As the leader of a renegade faction within the Bandidos, Kellestein is no stranger to danger. In fact, he relishes in it and escalates things to a new level that leaves the entire nation bewildered and aghast. With his tough nature and his reckless disregard for the law, Kellestein becomes a legend in the world of outlaw bikers, feared by his enemies and revered by his brethren. Born in 1949, not much is known about the upbringing of Wayne, leaving the world curious about the path that leads him to a life of crime. By the tender age of 18, he has already become a seasoned criminal, delving into burglaries, drug dealing, and even whispers of murder. Without any gang protection to shield him from the dangers of the Canadian underworld, Wayne is a vulnerable figure. In July 1977, the Outlaws Motorcycle Club expands into Canada, absorbing the Satan's Choice chapter in London, Ontario. Kellestein seeks membership, but is denied as he is seen as a heat score, a guy who continuously draws attention from the police. In 1982, he then is allowed to establish a puppet club of the Outlaws and names it the Holocaust Motorcycle Club, which didn't sit well with many other outlaw members and therefore is later renamed to the Annihilators Motorcycle Club in 1988. The sick name he chooses for his club already indicates what kind of twisted mind this guy has. However, Wayne's success is marred by his unpredictable temper, which frequently poses obstacles in his path. His fiery nature eventually leads to an incident in June 1991 when an outlaw member accuses Wayne of shooting him. The charges are eventually dropped when the accuser chooses not to testify, but the incident places Wayne under the watchful gaze of the police, who now regard him as a person of interest. A year later, in 1992, a moment of reckoning arrives for Wayne. As part of a police crackdown codenamed Project Bandito targeting both the Annihilators and the Outlaws, Kellestein is arrested at his farm. He is found drunk and high in his living room, surrounded by guns, cocaine, cash, and Nazi memorabilia. Little does Wayne know that his story is far from over. The farm may have been seized and his freedom stripped away, but the indomitable spirit within him refuses to be extinguished. As Wayne emerges from his prison cell, he finds himself thrust back into a world that has dramatically changed during his incarceration. The Hell's Angels, the outlaws' most formidable adversaries, have risen in power, igniting a fierce war for dominance within the criminal underworld. Determined to reclaim his former position, Wayne wastes no time in resuming his role as a biker boss. However, the outlaws, tired of Wayne's explosive temper and unpredictable nature, make a fateful decision to ban him and his club. Stripped of his once loyal comrades, Wayne finds himself grappling with a loss of power and influence. In search of a new alliance, he turns to the Loner's MC, where he forms a partnership with Giovanni Masadir, who swiftly becomes Wayne's protege and trusted right-hand man. While the Hell's Angels attempt to recruit Wayne, he defiantly rejects their offer. Enraged by his rejection, the Hell's Angels seek revenge and orchestrate a drive-by shooting targeting Wayne. Though he miraculously survives the attack, his troubles continue to mount. The Hell's Angels gain the upper hand in the ongoing war, attracting numerous clubs to their side and solidifying their grip on power. Realizing that he stands little chance against the rising tide of the Hell's Angels, Wayne makes a calculated decision to seek a powerful ally. He joins forces with the formidable Bandidos, the second most influential biker club in the world, aiming to shift the balance of power once more. However, his ambitions are thwarted when he is arrested in 2000 for illegal possession of firearms, sparking an intense police investigation. 
The authorities, not only investigating Wayne but also targeting him, uncover a cache of over 40 weapons in his possession. Although he is initially placed in custody, Wayne manages to secure release on bail after two years of legal battles. When he re-enters the world outside prison walls in 2002, he is met with a disheartening realization. His former protege, Giovanni Masedia, has ascended to the presidency of the Bandidos during Wayne's absence. Fueled by wounded pride and an unwillingness to accept his former protege's newfound authority, Wayne engages in a heated argument with Giovanni. However, the club rallies behind Giovanni, solidifying their support and accepting him as their rightful leader, further marginalizing Wayne in the process. The walls of loyalty that once surrounded him now stand as a barrier between Wayne and his desired position of power. Giovanni leads the Banditos with a quiet yet firm hand, driven by a personal code that forbids any involvement in the sale of methamphetamine due to his strong moral compass. However, his principled stance attracts its fair share of enemies. The American Bandito's presidents, in particular, disagree with his leadership style, citing the lack of profitability as their main concern. Faced with this opposition, the Bandidos decide to sever ties with Giovanni, stripping him and his crew of their Bandito affiliation. In response, Giovanni renames his club the No Surrender Crew, a defiant declaration of their independence. Despite the name change, tensions remain high as many members of the No Surrender crew continue to proudly display their Bandito patches. This flagrant disregard for the wishes of the American Bandidos further exacerbates the situation. Determined to resolve the issue, the American Bandidos arrange a meeting at the border between Canada and the United States, inviting Wayne Kellestein and Michael Santam, two influential figures, to represent their interests. The meeting is presided over by Peter Mongo Price, the most powerful man in the Bandidos. Price takes the opportunity to express the problem at hand, emphasizing that the continued display of Bandido patches by the No Surrender crew is not only disrespectful, but also a clear violation of club rules. However, he reassures Wayne and Michael that a violent confrontation is not the desired outcome. All he requests is that the No Surrender crew cease wearing the patches, in return, Price promises to appoint Wayne as the National Bandidos president, acknowledging his leadership qualities. Despite Price's intentions for a peaceful resolution, Wayne and Michael have a different plan in mind from the outset. Fueled by their desire for vengeance, they aim to eliminate Giovanni and his crew entirely. Wayne is armed to the teeth, and Michael has a loyal group of men ready to wage war against the No Surrender crew. To devise a strategic plan, Santam and his men convene at Kellestein's farm, where they intend to eliminate their adversaries in one fell swoop. In a cunning move, Wayne invites Giovanni Masidi and his crew to his farm under the pretense of addressing the discrepancies between the two groups. Oblivious to the impending danger, Giovanni agrees to the meeting, unknowingly stepping into a carefully laid trap. Time is of the essence, as the fateful encounter looms closer. Sensing the impending danger, Wayne swiftly sends his wife and daughter abroad, ensuring their safety while withholding the true reason behind their sudden departure. The No Surrender crew arrives at Wayne Kellestein's farm, the clock ticking past half past ten in the evening. Their numbers total eight men, Giovanni Masadir, Jamie Flans, George Criarakis, Luis Raposo, George Chasson, Paul Sinapoli, Frank Salamo, and Michael Trotter. Little do they know the treacherous fate that awaits them within those darkened grounds. As the crew steps onto the farm, a palpable tension hangs in the air, casting an eerie shadow over the scene. It is Luis Raposo who first senses that something is terribly amiss. His instincts ring alarm bells, and his gaze falls upon Michael Santam, gripping a menacing firearm. Swiftly realizing the danger, Raposo springs into action, unleashing a hail of bullets towards Santam. His shots find their mark, but to his dismay, Santam remains unscathed, shielded by a bulletproof vest. Recovering swiftly, Santam retaliates, his lethal gunfire finding Raposo, claiming his life in the chaotic crossfire. The sudden eruption of violence on the farm plunges the scene into chaos. Sensing a slim chance of escape, 
Sinapoli and Criaracas seize the moment to make a desperate break for freedom. However, their fleeting hopes are dashed as Wayne Kellestein intercepts their path, halting their flight. With Kellestein and Santam's crew now in control, the remaining members of the No Surrender crew find themselves held captive, their fate uncertain. Caught in the turmoil of the moment, Kellestein and Santam grapple with their own conflicted thoughts, uncertain of the immediate future. Seeking solace in alcohol, Kellestein drowns his troubles with each passing sip, even permitting one of the victims to make a call to his girlfriend. As time drags on, Wayne Kellestein makes a devastating decision, a choice that will seal the fate of the No Surrender crew. Determined to carry out his grim mission, he resolves to eliminate each member one by one, ensuring the completion of his sinister plan. Driven by his propensity for violence and alcohol, he takes out one after the other. With each life extinguished, Kellestein's resolve grows colder until he reaches the last of the No Surrender crew. However, his intoxicated state renders him unable to pull the trigger himself, thus delegating the task to his own loyal henchmen. Having accomplished his dark intentions, Kellestein devises a scheme to shift the blame onto the Hell's Angels. He orders his crew to transport the lifeless bodies of the No Surrender crew into Hell's Angels territory, intending to pass off the act as the handiwork of their rival gang. Yet, fate intervenes, and their plans are derailed when their vehicles run out of fuel just as they approach the territorial boundaries. Forced to abandon their cars, they seek refuge on a nearby farm, where they set the vehicles ablaze in a desperate bid to erase any incriminating evidence. Realizing the gravity of their predicament, Kellestein hastily makes calls to two trusted confidants, seeking their aid in obliterating any lingering traces of their macabre undertaking. However, unbeknownst to them, the vigilant eyes of law enforcement have already begun to scrutinize the case, launching a thorough investigation into the events that unfolded on that ill-fated night. The proximity of the burnt car to Kellestein's farm raises immediate suspicion, casting a damning light on Wayne Kellestein's involvement in the heinous crime. Law enforcement wastes no time, launching a meticulous forensic investigation on the premises. Their search yields damning evidence as the investigators discover victims' keys concealed within Kellestein's fireplace, a chilling testament to his connection to the murders. In a stroke of fortune for the investigators, they also stumble upon a partially burnt business card belonging to none other than Jamie Flans, further linking the suspects to the crime. The determined efforts of the police do not end there, as they meticulously scour the farm for any additional clues. Their exhaustive search yields results as they unearth the murder weapons, solidifying the case against Kellestein and his co-defendants. Following their apprehension, the suspects faced a trial that commenced on the 9th of January 2007. The jury, after careful deliberation, returned a verdict of guilty on all charges for Wayne Kellestein and his co-defendant. While Wayne Kellestein remains alive to this day, his fate is sealed within the confines of prison, where he will spend the remainder of his days paying for the crimes he orchestrated. The chilling events surrounding the No Surrender crew and their encounter with Kellestein's merciless plan serve as a haunting reminder of the depths of human depravity and the unwavering pursuit of justice by those who stand against it.